hey, let's get this video started. <clears throat> I hope y'all having a good day because today has been one of the best days of my life, honestly. Now, I'm about to check out Christ Church, man. The last thing I heard about Christ Church was that they had some KKK stuff going on over there. So maybe y'all let me know a little bit more about that. I heard it was, a, you know, going on over there and there was some KKK motives going on let me know if y'all know about that but uh christ church house of horrors bro what they got going on they got their own jeffrey Dahmer individuals in christ church what's up bro by the way christ church has almost a million people in it bro i thought christ church had like twenty five thousand people i swear to god i thought they had like two thousand people bro it got almost a million what the hell or not a million at least a quarter million at least it's in the six figures i thought it was five figures it's my first time, really. And it's Welcome to another chilling episode of True Crime Cases. Thank you for welcoming me. In an me. eastern suburb of Christchurch, New Zealand, a seemingly ordinary house hides a dark and twisted secret. Mm -mm -mm. The crime committed within was so sickening and depraved oh, that even investigators and psychologists do not fully understand the rationale behind it. This is the story of what happened inside that house. But before we begin, please smash that like and subscribe button. This don't even sound right knowing that this came out of On Christ September Church. 26, 2008, a cool Thursday morning, the Bower Tavern in Christchurch is alive with chatter. The Bower? The okay. clinking of glasses and distant laughter fills the air. A 28-year-old beautiful woman, Tisha Lurie, steps out of the front oh door to return. Oh my God, oh my. <laughs> hey. If y'all, okay, Tisha, she can definitely get this work all day. Tisha can get smacked all day. I like what I'm seeing right here now. So this is like that house where you could just walk past an ordinary house and stuff like this is going on. This the thing. Why are you at bars, though? Like, bro, if y'all know y'all look good and y'all vulnerable, don't go to a bar, especially with yourself. You put yourself in danger, especially when you look like this. Tisha like a whole snack out here, man. Home after spending some quality time with her grandma. Where the Tisha's at when I the get to New Zealand? I need to know. <laughs> and she is looking forward to his birthday Where celebration they gonna be tomorrow. At, bro? She doesn't usually get to spend much time with him, but recently she moved in because she wants to take a break from her 48 year old boyfriend and reflect Whoa. on some issues they have been having together. She has no idea that this is the last time she will ever see him or wow. anyone else. Tisha does not show up for her grandfather's birthday celebration the next day. Her mother, Tanya, is troubled by her daughter's absence. Real quick, before we get back to this video, I wanna let y'all know something real quick. First thing first, hope y'all having the best day of your life, and I really mean that, man. But I wanna let y'all know, I got two new YouTube channels. One is Twano Vlogs, it's called Twano Vlogs. I'm over there vlogging, you know, real life content, stuff like that, dates and whatnot, man. Make sure y'all check that channel out. Also, I'm in this semi-truck right now, so I'll have another channel, it's called Overtime Twano where I'm going through the trials and tribulations and the journey of trucking, man. Make sure y'all check that out as well. Link to that will be in the description. I'm gone, let's get it. Okay, I see where she get it from. Tanya, she, uh, she all right, huh? Finds it very unusual. Maybe when she was her younger, she was nice. Her first thought is that Tisha is with her boyfriend and she decides to give her some space. However, when she contacts Tisha's boyfriend the following day, she is alarmed to learn that he hasn't seen or heard from Tisha for days. Panic now sets in, oh, prompting no, the family to contact right the police there. and report Tisha missing. Maybe October she 2nd, as I thought. 2008, a week after Tisha's mysterious disappearance, Detective Senior Sergeant Virginia Labaz makes a public plea for information. The investigation intensifies, with police searching Tisha's grandfather's house and all the places she frequented. By October 7th, the search expands to the Avon River a scenic and peaceful spot that Tisha would have taken home from the tavern. Man, look at this, bro. So, I like Tisha vibe, though. Besides the fact she out here dating a 40-plus-year-old man, that's very strange. She's at, She likes to go to places like this. Nice little vibe, nice views and water, trees. I like that. As the police scour the riverbank in the water, the family distributes 1,200 flyers, hoping to find <clears throat> a clue or a witness. That's Tisha's her. sister... Liang reveals the family's emotional turmoil. 
Despite the involvement of 35 officers and extensive searches, the case remains a baffling mystery. As the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months, the hope That's of really finding strange. Tisha alive fades away. The it's next year, on June 11, 2009, a $20,000 reward is offered for information leading to Tisha's whereabouts. The desperate plea of Detective Labasse is echoed at a news a conference. Later. Tisha was last seen on September 26, 2008. Someone has the key to this mystery, and we need your help. One year later, in the aftermath of Tisha Lurie's disappearance, an unsettling mystery unfolded just two houses away from where she was staying. <clears throat> Hold on, bro, and this the thing, so this is a year later, so for all of y'all future little weird serial killers out there, don't think because it's been 10 months, 11 months that you good and you just in agreeing, because whoever did this, he probably felt like, oh man, I got away with that, it's been a year, no. no. Jason Somerville, this him? a resident in the vicinity, <clears throat> walked into the police station to report his wife gone. Okay. When he reported his wife missing, he told the police she had a history of depression, uh, addiction, and self-harm. Hinting that she may have committed suicide, he said she left without her keys, handbag, cell phone, and bank cards. He returned a few days later and told the police that someone had placed his wife's prescription glasses and wedding ring in their letterbox. The twist. Uh, wow. The detectives sat down with Jason, who had piqued their interest, Real and twist. were unprepared by what they were about to learn. For reasons unknown, Jason confessed to killing his wife, Rebecca. Adding further shock, he also confessed to killing Tisha the previous year. Oh, wow. No one truly knows why. And I was going to say, bro, like, maybe he's getting pushed to do this or something, but I was going to say, this is him. Like, he just looks like that type of weirdo that's doing that. But then they said he reported his wife missing, like, he was a victim. And I was, okay, maybe he is a victim, but he looks like the weirdo that would do this type of stuff. And he has this jumper on like he's in trouble right now. He also confessed What's to killing Tisha the here? previous year. <clears throat> no one truly knows why he confessed without much probing from the detective. Maybe he had hoped to get the $20,000 reward for Tisha's whereabouts. Why would or maybe get... the guilt was too much for him to bear. Weirdo. September 25th, <clears throat> 2008, Weirdo. Jason said he was chopping wood outside his home and went inside <clears throat> to get a drink. When he heard a knock on the door, it was Tisha Lori, his neighbor from two doors down. Hey, he recalls listen. she was wearing a Chicago Bulls jacket and jeans. He allowed her into his house and according to him, Tisha wandered around the lower floor looking for things before going upstairs. She played with the computer, looked at a filing cabinet, I asked her to leave. She was too Jason said he was annoyed with her, and despite him ordering her to leave. Okay, it sounds like she might have knew him a little bit, and they was just and she did this type of stuff normally. But if Tisha came over my crib, two houses down, and uh, she was all walking through the crib, not by four, something else probably would have happened though. You did. She refused to. At this point, You'll he never admits see me getting very angry, and pushed her down the stairs. She didn't lose her footing, and he put his hands around her neck. He said, I grabbed her and held on to her. At some point, I had her <clears> against <throat> the wall. She was fighting me. I held on to her until she stopped fighting. I knew this person was a goner because of how long I had held her. He admitted to strangling Tisha to death with his bare hands. It was so violent that he mentioned he noticed a good amount of blood was coming out of her face. Wow. He then left her body there and went to fetch a pair of his wife's underwear. Upon returning, he stuffed it down her throat. What happened? Wow, real weird, uh, bro. I thought that she was last seen at that bar in the beginning, remember? Next is truly sickening. He removed her jeans and underwear and had sex with her lifeless body. Of course he did. Jason Look at his left life. the house that afternoon to attend his <clears throat> Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Upon returning an hour oh, later, really? he realized his wife would be back at 3 p.m. He proceeded to open a hatch below his basement, which exposed an area below the foundations of his house that has dirt and soft ground. He then dragged Tisha's half-naked body and dropped it in the now open hole. He dropped wow. down, dug a shallow grave with his hands and a floorboard, covered Tisha's body in dirt before pulling himself back up and putting the hatch back on. Bro, this is Jason disgusting. then cleaned up the area as much as he could. Once his wife, Rebecca, returned, they went about their date as usual, carrying out some domestic chores and went to bed 
as if it was a day like any other. His wife, completely unaware of the corpse, she just a few feet home. below their bedroom. It's gonna stink. The next day, Rebecca left the house in the morning to attend a meeting. That's probably his house Jason really seized like this too. opportunity to descend into the opening, uncover Tish's body, and violate her corpse again. Tish's body, now in early stages of decomposition, was showing signs of rigor mortis, Damn, but Jason bro. wasn't bothered. He was now a full-fledged necrophile. Taking a moment. Necrophile means that you have sex with dead bodies, right? Let me just look at his eyes real quick, because, like, the eyes say a lot about somebody, and I could really see him doing this, bro. Just this, these eyes, he's guilty for sure. Look at his eyes. This man guilty right here. How could you do that twice in a row, you filthy rascal? Alleged necrophile. Taking a moment to say that this author was very disturbed when he learned of this fact. This video aims to expose the twisted mind of Filthy Jason animal. Somerville. Jason told the police his motive for attacking Tisha was due to the anger he felt from her refusal to leave his residence despite his commands. Yeah, right. In boy. the months following, Jason and Rebecca Chamberlain Ugh. carried on with their lives as usual. During this time, it was reported Jason would discuss That's Tisha's Jason. disappearance with their neighbors and said, what if they've got her locked in a dungeon? <clears throat> and they are having sex with her, as if he is hinting at his deranged fantasy. <clears throat> it's unclear if he violated Tish's body again. Hey, whoever these neighbors is that's having this conversation with Jason, y'all probably weird too, because I'm trying to think of where, if we was having a serious, sincere conversation about a dead neighbor, where would I ever have the room to say, yeah, what if they locked her up and having sex with her? Like, that wouldn't even be appropriate, unless y'all having a funny little lighthearted conversation about it, and that's where it would not be right. So the, whoever the other neighbor is is weird because for one, I wouldn't even be having a conversation with no Jason like this, especially to the point that he would feel comfortable enough to say a little joke like that or hint at anything like that. Jason is completely disgusting, bro. Watch y'all neighbors, man, especially if you got daughters. Because he only admitted weird to doing dude. it twice. It seemed Jason's wife, Rebecca. And her and his wife right here, she's weird as hell because she knows him. You with this man every day. The fact that he would do something like that says a lot about you as a woman, you nasty little animal. Never suspected something sinister in their home. Yeah, right. And it appears there was no detectable odor of a decaying corpse, despite months of her body being Yeah, there. right. This is because there was you so lying. much other filth and smells around the house that it masked the putrid smell of decomposition. B word. But more on that later. Sadly. Rebecca never learned the truth, as Jason also confessed to killing her. <laughs> Rebecca her and Jason too. Somerville's rocky. Oh, is this two different people? Like, what the? F look at this person, and then look at this person. Like, bro, what the hell? Where's all the wrinkles at? This must be a high school picture or something. Relationship. Cheer. Rebecca and Jason Somerville's rocky relationship. Jason and Rebecca Sarah Chamberlain met in the early 2000s. Rebecca had a young son at the time from a previous relationship. In 2003, they got married at Taupo Baptist Church and a few years later had two daughters together. Financially, they were struggling. Jason worked stocking trolleys at a supermarket and Rebecca worked as a cleaner in a fast food restaurant. In 2005, they had to sell their house and downsize to a smaller flat to ease their financial burden. Bum, 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 bum. According to the person who purchased their property, Jason was a very jittery, anxious person, and the home was filthy and damaged, I with walls was, and doors bro. that looked like they had been kicked in or hit with a hammer. There were also feces Trifling. on the carpet. It could hardly be called a home. Trifling. In 2010, an Why are these people always dirty? You know what? They say cleanliness is next to godliness, so clearly the opposite is true. Dirtiness is next to whatever the opposite of God would be. They always filthy in these videos, man. Jason and her, her, his wife is disgusting. If they house stinks, you know they say a woman's bathroom says a lot about her. You know that she stinks. If her house is dirty and her man is dirty like that, she's stinky and dirty. Nasty ass people, man. Article would be published stating a neighbor of the Somervilles had described overhearing Jason speak to his wife and kids and I missed it. it could hardly be called a home. In 2010, an article would be published stating a neighbor of the Somervilles had described overhearing Jason speak to his wife and kids in a brutally disgusting manner. He said, kids too? He was a bloody mongrel. I heard him one day yelling abuse at his kids. I wouldn't speak to my dogs like that. And I told him if I heard him speak like that again, 
I would drop him on the spot. He treated his wife and kids like shit. She seemed petrified of him. He seemed in complete control over her, big mouth, no guts. Around late 2005, they took custody of Jason and Rebecca's children. The exact- Bro, that story just don't add up though. Like as far as Tisha, Trisha going over there, why was they so cool to the point that Trisha will go over there and mess around and play with the keyboard and the computer? There's a lie right there. That's Jason side of the story. Why did she knock on that door? What happened? Did she really knock on the door like, hey, Jason, do you got some salt? And he just yanked around like, hey, come here. <clears throat> and then did what he did. How did that really work? What's the real truth behind that? We can't go off with just his side of the story on that, man. Fact reasons for why are unclear, but there are speculations. This is due to the physical abuse yes, suffered by know. Jason's oldest child, including hearsay that Jason may have hanged the oldest child from the shower rail. What? One thing is clear. What did I just miss, bro? No way I'm missing stuff off of a two second Unclear, pause, bro. but there are speculations. This is due to the physical reasons why they took custody of Jason and Rebecca's children. The exact reasons for why are unclear, but there are speculations. This is due to the physical abuse suffered by Jason's oldest child, including hearsay that Jason may have hanged the oldest child from the shower rail. <laughs> One thing is clear, it, it was not an ideal home to raise children, and both parents were substance abusers. I the Topo that. Baptist Church community was handed custody and care of the children. It Imagine was not that. until around 2007 that Jason and Rebecca moved. Imagine that these devils are getting married in your church that you go to to praise the Lord and they're getting married there. Ironic. Christchurch. It was not until around 2007 that Jason and Rebecca moved to Christchurch into what is now known as the infamous House of Horrors. Jason was a laborer at his father's farm and was learning carpentry on the side. He was also doing a lot of renovations in their house. However, despite the seemingly improved situation, they informed them they were still not deemed fit to have returned custody of their children. Hearing this news, Rebecca's substance and painkiller addiction. Bro, Rebecca is slow in the head. She is clearly not all the way there. And she looks like a man, too. She looks like that guy off of Home Improvement a little bit. She just looked like, what's his name? Bill Norris or something like that? Chuck Norris, whatever his name is. Bro, she looks crazy. And those glasses look too small on her. And her eyebrows look like mine a little bit. And she got like a manly lip going on right here, bro. This is not a woman, are we sure? This is disgusting all the way around, bro. This is Jason's work right here. Man, look at that neck, bro. God damn, she's like one of the kids on the wrestling team in 10th grade or something, bro. This is crazy. Only got worse. She even began self-harming by cutting herself and had several trips to the emergency I don't psychiatric even feel bad care. For it, bro, she decided to seek help and eventually got sober and stopped self-harming. Working with the family lawyer, Temporarily. they again attempted to regain custody of their children. It is she's a weirdo, not easy bro. to make good beats with this kid. We cannot feel bad for these weirdos, man. We can't, bro. We cannot. From their lawyer, Peter Burns, were praising Rebecca, but they thought Jason was a very nervous, edgy person and rather odd. He sure. said they sent at least 10 applications to court regarding custody, and she wrote them all. They were just brilliant. You would think that a lawyer wrote them. Wow. She was very intelligent. She had cleaned herself up and just wanted to be a mom. Despite all these attempts, they were unable to get custody of their children Good. back. And this the thing, man. A lot of people shouldn't even have kids. Like, they out here, Jason and this woman right here is sitting here repopulating, bro, on the earth. They got more kids than me. Why is it that they have kids and I don't? That should be, that should not even be legal, bro. That should not be legal. They should not be allowed to have kids and repopulate, reproduce. That's the word I was looking for. Rebecca's murder. Fast forward almost a year from Tisha's demise. It was a usual Sunday morning. Jason Somerville and his wife of six years, Rebecca Chamberlain, were asleep in their bed upstairs at their house. Jason woke up first and initiated sex with Rebecca. She said no. Jason tried once again, nice eyes but the her. answer was the same. This interaction continued several times before Jason, now frustrated, left the bedroom to go downstairs and fix himself a cup of coffee. Soon after he returned to the bedroom and attempted to have sex with his wife again, she refused once more, saying she wasn't in the mood. According to Jason, 
This made him feel rejected and the fairly she would ever get in the movie. He said, I grabbed her by the throat and held on to her. I locked her in a headlock. I snapped. Rebecca struggled. Hey, so he liked to put people in a headlock, huh? I hope whoever his cellmate is, bro, and anybody in his pod, they need to put him in the headlock, man. And just return the favor from the karma log, bro. The law of karma, he should get strangled, man, for a while. But Jason only tightened his headlock in response. He said, when she finally gave up, he put him in headlock. I let go. I honestly thought she was going to this be fine when I let go of her. John Cena he then left something. his wife unconscious in the bedroom and went to relieve himself in the toilet. After returning to the bedroom, he was surprised to see Rebecca still unmoving. He checked for a pulse on her neck, but couldn't detect one. Bro, imagine being so, like, delusional that you just, you literally like, yeah, yeah, mm, 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 mm. to the point that she can't move and you just got her like that. And then you like, you let her go. All right, I'll be back. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the bathroom go to the bathroom and then come back and you shocked that she's not moving no more. This guy's a real weirdo, bro. Instead of trying to revive her, he did the opposite. He placed his hands firmly on her neck, making sure to apply firm downward pressure from his fingers and thumb on her arteries. This ensured she would never regain consciousness. He, took a restroom he had obliterated all hope of reviving her. He had killed once again, Freaking. this time his own wife, and ensured she stay dead. Jason said, it's the first time I've actually had someone die after I've let them go after doing that. I don't understand why the hell she died. I mean, shit, when you let someone go they're supposed to live, man. And then I initially tried to cover my tracks. It seemed Jason's only concern was himself and didn't care if his wife lived or died. In fact, he made sure she wouldn't survive after he brutally reacted to her refusals to have sex with him. He's saying that like he did that to a lot of people. Yeah, typically on whenever I do this procedure, they usually don't die. Do it to me. I want you, Jason, bro, looking at me right now, fool. Try that on me, man. That's what I want you to do, bro. You know what I'm saying? Then he stuffed her panties down her throat and proceeded to have sex with her body. Deja vu for what he had done to Tisha less than a year ago. Once he was done, he said, quote, I kissed her on the forehead and said goodbye to her. I panicked. I dragged her off the bed, dragged her downstairs. I was more worried about the trouble I would get into. And it was crazy. Like Tisha, he dug a shallow grave below his house he probably and was covered Rebecca's corpse with dirt, burying her next to Tisha. According to the police, Jason Somerville exhibited moments. And it's disrespectful because she don't even deserve to be buried next to her. Now, I'm not going to lie. We've seen a couple other pictures of Tisha, and it's making me reconsider if this really what she looks like. But going off of this picture though right here, Tisha is a solid uh, nine for sure in my book. Now, burying her next to her should be illegal as well. Absolutely illegal, bro. Her next to Tisha. According to the police, Jason Somerville exhibited moments of remorse expressing bewilderment at his own actions during the interview. In his own words, I don't understand. That's two lives I know I shouldn't have taken. I honestly don't understand it cause it goes against each, everything I've been taught. September 7, uh, 2009. After the confession, me. the New Zealand police went to the property to dug up Tisha Lori and Rebecca Chamberlain's body that night. They had informed Tisha and Rebecca's family Tisha, who was of Maori origin, had family and members of the community. Oh, and she was Maori. Oh, man. She looked Maori, too. I just seen it in her face, bro. She was Maori, too. Jason, you filthy animal, bro. I wonder what happened to Jason, man. I wonder what, is there any stories on this, man? Tisha, who was of Maori origin, had family and members of the community perform the haka, a dance they likely to honor haka for and her. respect her soul. Man, this the video. Oh, it's not even the right video. This the kid's doing it for somebody, a victim of a, of a gunshot, of a shooting. Still deep though, so yeah. This 
game. Jason caused this. Bro, stop but who was Jason me, Somerville? Let's try to unravel his past and uncover the forces that may have propelled him towards the abyss of such unspeakable crimes. Jason Paul Somerville was born on January 20th, 1976, in Christchurch, 50. the eldest of four children to Graham and Rosemary Somerville. Despite his See, family, Christchurch always, bro. I'm getting a vibe that Christchurch got all the weirdos, man. Like anywhere that somebody would be weird and do something weird, it's gonna be Christchurch. Cause that one story about that guy that did that shooting and whatnot, I believe that's Christchurch too. Family's initial stability. What is it about his this parents city? divorced in 1989 when Jason was 13, leading him to move with his mother and siblings to Topo for a fresh start. However. Financial struggles persisted despite Rosemary's involvement in the Mormon church. In Topo, Jason attended school but faced difficulties. He was illiterate and perceived as slow by his peers, he enduring bullying his due to his mother's mental illness and his own struggles. His reactions to bullying sometimes turned violent. He was described as an oddball and a loner. Bullied at school, he would sometimes retaliate and go for the throat of his attackers. As a 14-year-old boy, should. he started stealing women's underwear from their hanging laundry. As he crept he around not. at night, peeping in windows. In his caravan, oh, he, was a real he used to masturbate while watching women getting undressed through his binoculars. Also, he liked to watch real weird porn stuff. Like, not watch porn through a screen, but through a window, through a different type of screen in person. This guy was a real weirdo. I wouldn't be surprised if he was going around snatching bunny necks off and cutting them and taking butterflies and slowly snatching them off and then getting the microscope and even looking at the little parasites and slowly killing them in half and little weird stuff like that. This guy, that's what I'm saying. They don't need to reproduce, bro, because his mom was mentally ill. If you're mentally ill, especially diagnosed, you should not have any kids or it should be limited and your kids should be on severe watch because that's a problem, man. Clearly, this is what's going on, bro. The mentally ill offspring is doing stuff like this, bro. Leaving school in the early 1990s, Jason relied on odd jobs and government support. Despite his challenges, he managed to purchase property where he lived throughout the 1990s. For his behavior, he received warnings from a local cop and he also committed burglaries, but got away without charges. Burglaries. He was prescribed Tegretol, an anticonvulsant medication for epilepsy, which he said also helped control this quote mood swings. Jason was once again warned to stop stalking women, but was still not charged. Somerville never had mean? a criminal record he had only and it's crazy because this picture right here, Jason, he looks like a, a simple man. Like, he do look like X-Men a little bit. I could see him being weird. But if you told me he was just a blue-collar guy that was doing construction and he had a family and kids, I could believe that, too. He looked like he might have had potential with a decent woman. Like, he was just doing weird stuff, though, sitting there watching girls. And this is just a picture. I haven't seen his mannerisms. I haven't seen how he moves his neck if he does some weird owl stuff. If he messes with his fingers as he's talking, I don't know what's little. I'm looking at a picture right here. He looked like a simple, not too ugly type of guy, bro. Like he could pull, he could probably get something nice if he put the effort in. Go ahead and clean the beard up and, and dress pretty, pretty nice. What made him do this weird stuff, bro? Weirdo, man. Only a minor driving violation, and had largely flown under the radar. It seems he was largely ignored by society and the police and any developmental issues he may have had were allowed to fester and grow, leading him to later commit the heinous actions against Tisha and his own wife. Sentencing. The official sentencing for these heinous I crimes took me. place on January 29, 2010. As Justice Lester Chisholm entered the courtroom, a hushed anticipation fell over the gallery. Jason Somerville stood before him, Scott. his demeanor betraying no hint of emotion. The air was thick with tension as That's Justice him. Chisholm began his sentencing remarks. Yeah, I could see that. Meticu I could see that like tidget, like fidgety, like stuff they was talking about, timid stuff. I could see that. Thick with tension as Justice Chisholm began his sentencing remarks, meticulously outlining the heinous crimes committed by Somerville. Justice Chisholm began, his voice grave, quote, your explanation was that you were angry with Tisha 
and as far as I can get. That's crazy because Tish is so fine, bro. She looked like, hold on. Your explanation was that at least off of this picture right here, Tisha looked like she could have been a, a, what's the word, like a musician or something, like a, what's that word I'm looking for, like an artist. Like she could have been an artist, something in the movie or something. She kind of got that vibe. Like if I seen Tisha in person, bro, I gotta scoop her up. What? What do you mean, boy? have to what you were angry with tisha and as far as i can gather this was because she would not leave and you were angry with i can gather your explanation was that you were angry with tisha and as far as i can gather this was because she would not leave i don't believe that and you were angry with rebecca because she refused sex despite somerville's claims of remorse justice chisholm remained unconvinced according to the probation officer you displayed no remorse or victim empathy, he stated flatly. The murders that you have committed have left the Lori and Chamberlain families with an... Okay, and this is the thing too, you know, whenever you hear the truth, it kind of comes with the breath of air, bro. Whenever I heard that to be the truth, that she wouldn't leave the home, I don't believe that. You telling me Tisha, that girl, that woman, would not want to leave Jason weird as his house? She wouldn't want to leave his home? Now, I can't see that because sometimes people do things that's just when they bored she might have just been bored having nothing to do no job and just go over there and like the fuck with him i don't know but as far as being refusing to leave the home i doubt that honestly but him doing that to his wife because she ain't want to yeah she didn't want to give him no play i believe that too i believe that irreplaceable part, I mean. loss Not too. justice chisholm delivered the final blow what do you get this is how ai optimizes my schedule so i have a how much time did this weirdo get bro should've so to life. summarize, if it's you not are life, sentenced to life imprisonment. Itself. There we go. You must serve a minimum of 23 years. While it was understood that Jason had a difficult start in life, with brain trauma, a head injury, and suffered sexual abuse during his teenage years, it was also noted that according to a psychiatrist and psychologist, let's keep it a thousand, bro. How many of us suffer sexual abuse? Because that's a broad term, bro. I can't say I did that. A woman, an older woman, a couple older women, different stories touched me as a young man before I was ready for all that type of stuff. At least, at least minimum age eight. I'm going to just say that minimum age eight. That's what you would call sexual abuse. A lot of people in just women that I talk to and that I know and my family that some of y'all watching the bro have been touched as kids. Let's keep it all the way a thousand. How many of us are out here doing these things, bro? Sexual abuse is not a reason to do something like this. That's not a good excuse. And that's a broad statement, bro. Sexual abuse. They didn't say none of that in his little story right here. They didn't go into detail or even bring it up about any of the sexual abuse. So it must not be that detrimental. In age years, it was also noted that according to a psychiatrist and psychologist, none of these had resulted in an identifiable mental disorder. And throughout the case, right. Jason Somerville showed right. no remorse or empathy for his victims. Of course he did. The sexual aspect and impulsive nature of his crimes was considered a significant indication of future risk, and there was a substantial likelihood of further sexual or violence offenses. Absolutely. All things considered, the judge allowed for a three-year reduction in his sentence due to his guilty plea. It was noted that Somerville remained emotionless all through the sentencing. Somerville's fate was sealed his punishment a reflection of the gravity of his crimes victim impact and that's the statement thing too so okay yeah so tisha might have been nice because see that's the thing she looked way different right there bro she looked way different right here but this the thing though so they were saying he was making renovations in the home this is not a this is not a home for them this is like a, a it's not really an apartment neither but it's not a home it's like a town home a little bit this is not their home right here they moved into fourplex, I guess. It's like a fourplex. And not even that all the way, but... So this guy... I forgot I was going to say, y'all. A it. reflection <laughs> of the gravity of his crimes. I forgot I was going to say, bro. Fuck Victim it, impact bro. statements. In the wake of Somerville sentencing, the courtroom bore witness to the raw anguish of the victims' families. Tisha Lurie's loved ones stepped forward, their voices trembling with grief and fury, as they addressed Somerville directly. She looked you don't deserve to be on this earth. Tish's younger brother, Jacob, declared, his words ringing with righteous indignation. Electric chair. Their mother, Tanya, voiced her. He need to get that electric chair, but he needs to not die, though. 
give him the electric chair right into the point where he's about to die and then let him come back and do that at least once a once a month that sounds pretty right a very gruesome punishment is what he deserves her hatred for somerville her anguish palpable Bro, she i like hate him I know. she spat her voice choked with tears i wouldn't Bro, wish so the emotions this has caused me on my worst enemy Feel, Similar sentiments echoed from Rebecca Chamberlain's family. Their pain. And it's like, damn, what did the mom do to deserve that as a karmic um, effect to her offspring? I mean, to her. Like, what did the mom do to deserve that? It's pretty much what I'm saying. Why did mom deserve that? Your kid going through all that, bro, that just can lead to so many different thoughts and different ideas and things you might have feel like was your fault or just why me why my child why this why that that affects you for the rest of your life for until you die bro since that day that that, that the for one since the day that she found out her daughter was missing that affected her and then to find out the truth since that day that affected her because then it came back again like i'm pretty sure since the daughter was missing she never had no answers and never went away but it came back full fledged to find out what really happened. And then once she found out what really happened, the rest of your days is changed now. She can never just go back to blissfulness and being ignorant to anything. But at least she knows what happened though. At least she knows what happened and she got clarity on that. Jason was a weirdo all around the board. Two doors etched down. etched deep into their, their faces. Their neighbor did that. A poem penned by Rebecca herself served as a poignant reminder of the vibrant life extinguished by Somerville's hands. I am not a mistake. Her words echoed through the courtroom, a testament to her resilience and strength. Through tear-stained eyes, Rebecca's mother and father shared their heartache with the court. Their voice- Another thing though, for the father, ah, uh, why did you let her date Jason? Like you as a man, this is what I'm saying. That's why it's so important. If I have a daughter, I gotta know who she's planning on marrying. I gotta read you like a freaking book. I have to. I would have seen the weird, the weirdoness in Jason. I would have spotted it out, bro. Maybe not instantly, but I would have caught on to it. And you're not about to marry him. You're not, unless you do it behind my back, then you're vanished from the family, bro. But I'm doing this to protect you. I care about you. This guy is clearly a serial killer type of dude. You're not about to marry him. Why do you even like this guy? These are things that I would have been talking to my daughter. So for the father right here, man, could have prevented that, bro. Honestly, could have prevented this. Man. This is trembling with sorrow. I think so, at least. I really miss Rebecca and feel lost without her in my life. Her father's words hung heavy in the air, a poignant reminder of the irreplaceable void left in the wake. Another of thing, too, the fact that she was living with Jason in a dirty ass house says a lot about her parents, too. So her parents once again, could have prevented that, raised her with higher standards. Why would you wanna, my daughter would not wanna live with a guy who has a dirty ass house like that, bro. Of her senseless death. Conclusion. Absolutely not. The infamous house of horrors was purchased by Christchurch City Council, torn down, and a park was erected in its place. It's a part of White That's Ribbon good. New Zealand Foundation, a place that offers tools to support men to That's behave good. responsibly as adults and as caregivers to influence young men to prevent tragedies like this. Damn, the harrowing tale of Tisha Laurie and Rebecca Chamberlain serves as- But what happened to Tisha though? Cause she looks so different from here to here. Like, is this the same person or what? Hold on, where's it at? In with this in anguish palpable. Like bro, that's not her. No way. Even the eyebrows is completely Bro, this is not her, bro. Whoever made this video, this is literally not her. Because if you look at that picture right there, right? But the hairline is the same, though. The eyebrows is really what's different, though. Let me see. Yeah, them eyebrows is different, bro. That is not her. And I feel like I've seen this person before. Maybe this, either this is the real her or the other girl is the real her. One of these, but these are not each other though, for sure they're not each other. Off of these noses, this is the mom right here. This is the mom nose, this is her nose. I'm gonna say that, I don't know, bro. I don't know. Let me know what y'all think. Is the eye color even the same though? I don't know what y'all think, bro. 
that's pretty much the end of this, though. This is uh, crazy, bro. <sighs> Y'all stay away from the Jasons out here, man. They'll get you. They will get you. We out of here, man. Let's go. Let's go.